Okay, this is Christian Bible Chapel, and we want to thank the Lord for everyone who sort of behind, got behind. Dealing earlier, we were uh, teaching on the uh, family and home God designed for it, and we got lost in time there. All right, in our Sunday school lesson today, we're dealing with Jesus and his time. Now, what we're doing is we're looking at the ministry, the ministry of Jesus from his, his work and his ministry from his birth, and we're traveling through the uh, culture times, the biblical setting at the time that Jesus grew up as a boy and as a man by the time he perform started performing his ministry in miracles and wonders, uh, he preached the word of God suffered and died on the cross and was buried. And so within the compounds of this lesson, we're going to be uh, pulling out some very much intriguing um, lessons. And I we ask you to get the book because we're going to be following uh, your, in chapter 1, the birth of the Savior. Now in chapter 2, starting at page 37, Let's look to the Lord in prayer. All right. Again, if you have any questions. All right. Father, we thank you once again as we come to the blessed word of God. We thank you for how you have intervened in the lives of history to bring about the, the deliverer, the Savior, whom we know is Jesus. We pray, Father, that as we study his life, his ministry, that it will so intrigue us as believers in Christ to, to adore and admire the wonderful teachings and his ministry and his purpose for coming. We pray that those that are not saved will see the great impact that this man Jesus alone changes not only time event but the calendar itself that he is the true only prophet of God that came into the world to be the deliverer and savior we thank you Father and then grant us wisdom knowledge and understanding of your word in Jesus name we pray amen now at the end I told you that we was going to go into chapter 3 of Matthews and Luke chapter 3 and dealing with John the Baptist but I want to back up a little bit before we get to John the Baptist and Jesus coming to present himself to John the Baptist because at that time at that time Jesus is about 29 or 30 years old or so and he's he got to uh, uh, be anointed to uh, begin his ministry but before that in chapter 2 of your book Jesus and his time, the pace is this. Herod, the family line of Herod now, Herod, the king. Right? Now, we're, 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 we're talking about uh, the, the first and Herod Antipas and the son. We're talking about those two first because those two are the ones that's going to uh, have a major impact on the coming of Jesus as a babe, the father, Herod, and then his son is going to pick it up after his father died and begin to uh, then begin to uh, rule as king of the Jews during the time of Jesus' ministry. So we see that in chapter 2, we find out that Herod, you see that picture there? Uh, Herod is seeking to, uh, because remember, uh, the, the Caesar at that time, along with Mark Anthony right, and others, had named Herod king of the Jews. Right? Of course, he wasn't a Jew, but he, was, he sought to convert himself. He saw an interest in the people of Israel. He wanted the blessings, he wanted the fortunate blessing, you know, like people in the church today, people want the blessings from God, they want uh, healing, they want everything that, it, that, that, that 
comes with Christianity, but they don't want to accept Jesus as their Savior. They don't want to repent. They, they don't want forgiveness of sins, but they receive the money, the billions, the money, the lifestyle, the healing, the wealth, the prosperity. And that's how it is in the church today. Herod is in the same way. So in chapter 2 here, we see that Herod is going against the city of Jerusalem. He wanted to conquer Jerusalem. Now his purpose was to tear down the old site of the temple and rebuild the temple more glorious than before. And, and matter of fact, he's going to and he's going to succeed in doing this. He's going to make the temple, the temple site, even more famous, glorious, powerful than during the time of David and Solomon. Now, the temple was destroyed uh, by the Babylonians, okay? And the Jews were sent to Babylon, and they stayed there for 70 years. After 70 years was over, Cyrus gave the decree for the Jews to go back and, and build the temple, the wall and everything like that. And that took a couple of years. Right. Matter of fact, it took a long time under uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, and others. Okay, at that time Jeremiah was there in in Jerusalem, so he he met Ezra, he met Nehemiah, and all the rest of the guys. See, all the prophets they had some connection with each other, whether we call it major or minor prophet, whatever the case may be. I guess they call it minor because it only had one, two, or five chapters wherein Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, and all of them had 12, 18, 30, 40 some chapters, 50 some chapters or so. All right, but in any case, all the prophets somehow in their own category of time, they sort of bumped heads with each other, not in a negative way, in a uh, ill manner way, but they knew each other in such a manner, okay? So we come to chapter two that Herod is setting about to uh, build Jerusalem and the temple. Now, the reason why I went that way because last week we, we talked about the temple site itself. And let's see, you won't, I tell you what, um, in your books, uh, turn to chapter 5 because on page uh, on page 130 and 31, you have the complete diagram picture of the temple. Right, so turn there. King Herod, King Herod, uh, magnificently, richly rebuilt uh, the temple and Jerusalem. Okay, and he used great wealth in in doing this. So if you turn to uh, page 131, we begin our reading here. Now all this is in between the chapters 2 and 3 of Matthew and Luke and Mark. Okay? It says, all those scholars and historians included in the second temple period, the temple built by Herod the Great was actually the third and in all accounts the largest to occupy the Temple Mount. Now remember Solomon, Solomon built the temple and it was rich. I mean he built it out of ivory, gold, precious jewelry. I mean it was magnificent. So in order to outdo Solomon, Herod built the temple bigger and made it more famous. This made many of the Jews succumb to the rulership of Herod. They fell in line with Herod because he sort of interests in the temple. Anytime any country, whether it's even today, that people begin to um, get offerings and money and settlements and all that to help the temple, to help Jerusalem, you become a friend of Israel. So that's what's happening at this particular time. Okay? So it's, hmm.
Wait, no, wait. well, he no. he didn't he didn't tear it all the way down piece by piece. He rebuilt the temple. All right, uh, they were still offering sacrifices. They were still doing what they usually do. See, it's just like when you go into um, uh, an establishment, a company. You don't tear down the whole thing. You just piece by piece within or around it build it up or make it better. And that's what Herod did. All right. He he saw the site and he just made it bigger and more glorious. He expanded it and he used more uh, structure than than it had before and made the second the temple as far as uh, the temple that Solomon built, it was smaller but it it served its purpose. So what King Herod did he made it bigger than what Solomon did, and he enticed the Jews to become their friend. And so the, the Jews at that time became friends with Herod, but not all the Jews. Uh, there were zealots, who was a militant group of uh, Jews who hated Herod and, and, and uh, wanted Herod removed, and they, they, they killed soldiers or they killed uh, they try to get at Herod. Okay? Now, the scripture lets us know that Herod had uh, married his um, brother's wife. That was one thing that, one of the things that the Jewish people overlooked, but some of the Jews couldn't overlook because they felt that was a sin and a reproach against the law of Moses. Alright? Um, but, the, but the temple... If he knew, he knew that if he was to modify and graciously rebuild the temple and made it more precious and bigger, he would gain the attention of the Jews. Now, see, there's a reason for this. It was Jerusalem and that Palestine area was a hot spot in the Roman Empire. Something was always going on in Palestine at that time. Right? And the Romans couldn't bring peace or uh, comfortability to that area spot. So when the Caesar made Herod that Herod made a promise that he was going to calm the situation down in Jerusalem in Palestine. Okay, So what he attempted to do was in order to calm the Jews and, 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 and get the Jews to submit to the Roman power and to his power also he took upon himself to say, well, I'm going to do something that's on the heart of all Jews. Make the temple in Jerusalem more fortified, more bigger, more glorious. And that's what he did. And, and, and many of the Jews at that time uh, succumbed to the leadership of Herod, not knowing that Herod was mean, vicious, and greedy, and he really aligned himself with the Romans. And he really didn't. He really didn't have no favor toward Jews. I mean, he, you know, just it was a money thing. It was a power struggle. All right. And um, so we see here on that page. You see that the picture of it. We see it. Uh, how see how big it was and how it became famous worldwide. Herod made it that way. Okay. When the temple and the site and Jerusalem became famous, Herod became famous, well known in the Roman Empire. It sparked the attention of Mark Anthony, Cleopatra, and Augustus Caesar at that time. And not only that, there was others who was governing Judea as far as Pontius Pilate and the rest of them, uh, the uh, associates. And that brings us to, in the scriptures, in Luke, I, I'm trying to identify the scriptures as we move towards it. Remember when we, we saw in Luke chapter 2, it came to pass in those days that went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be censored. And this censor was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one to his own city. And therefore Joseph also went out from Galilee, 
out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. So if you, if you had a map on the back of your book or in front of your book, you see the distance between the city of David, which is Bethlehem, from Judea. It's like Washington, the president of, of the United States, does all his business at the White House. And sometimes he goes to Maryland, which is called Camp Meade. But his home is in New Jersey. I'm talking about President Biden. His home is in uh, New Jersey. So this is what the situation here. David ruled from Jerusalem. His home was Bethlehem of Judea. All right. So th everyone went back to be censored and he took Mary. Okay. So we looked at that last week and week before, which brought us to both Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Synoptic Gospel, the first two or three chapters of each of those Gospels, mainly chapter 1 and chapter 2. What we're looking at today is how that before Jesus began his ministry, Herod had that temple up running and powerful and gorgeous, glorious before the people. Right. Now, we left off last week because I told you that we were going to look at a, a diagram of the, uh, of the um, temple site, which is on page 131. You see that, that there was a part which was called the court of the woman. You see that? The court of the women. This part is where... When you see, remember we read how that Anna, uh, um, Anna, Anna was prophetess, and that that's where she dwelt at. Right? Any woman that that wanted to serve Jehovah God as either a virgin or a widow, they would come to Jerusalem, and it was a place where they could live and exist. And it was called the court of the women. That's as far as they went uh, on the temple site. No woman served as a priest or a prophet within the realm of the temple site itself. All right? You see, the temple site itself covered two halves, two halves of the temple, the holy place and the holy of holies. Okay. A woman was not allowed in those two parts. Okay, There was a court of the women, there was a court of the Gentiles. And what that means is that there was a part in which on the temple ground, not on the temple site, the temple grounds, right, wherein women and Gentiles could come and worship God, but they couldn't go any further into the temple site area. Only the males could go that far into the temple site. But outside, to the northern or the southern part, you had a part called the court of the women, you had the court of the, um, uh, of the Gentiles. You also had the chambers of the leopards, the part where the wood was kept, the chambers of wood. Uh, you had a part called also, the part called the chambers of the Nazareths. And also you had the part, it was four of them, the part, the chambers of oils, where all the oil and all the ingredients of the oils were kept. That was on the temple grounds. The temple grounds was not a dedicated, consecrated place. The temple site was. That's where the holy place was, the court of the priests, the altar, the ram, the altar, the brazen altar, and all that was kept. Then in back of that was the holy of holies, when, wherein only the high priest could go into. Right? Everyone follow me, therefore. Okay? The court of the women... The reason we are emphasizing that because of the two people that met uh, Jesus coming out after Jesus was circumcised, his, his, Joseph and Mary was coming out of the a section 
where they did that, performed that operation, and they came on one point, they came to the point in which they met Simon, Luke, in Luke's gospel, and Simon prayed to God that he wouldn't die until he see the Messiah. Then as they left Simon, they moved on, and as they was coming out onto the grounds part, they was coming through the court of the women, and the woman Anna was there, and she met them, and gave her blessing upon them. All right. And then that's when Joseph and Mary headed back home. On the way home, uh, Jesus, they thought Jesus was with the other relatives of the family. And what had happened was that Jesus got caught up in the crowd that he was speaking in the temple area. Okay? And what had happened was that Joseph and Mary went back to Jerusalem because relatives were saying, yeah, I saw him. He was back when we left. We saw him traveling through the caravan back to the, to the city. So that's when Mary and Joseph went back to the city and found Jesus in the company of the religious people, guys, the men, speaking. So Joseph went in and called attention to Jesus and said, come out, your mother and I have to speak with you. So Jesus excused himself and came out of that part and came to the grounds where his mother could was at. And Joseph and Mary, and they say, How, why did you leave us? What, you know, so that's when Jesus said to his father and his mother, did not you know that I had to be about my father's business? Okay, so that brought us to chapter um, uh, chapter two. Okay, uh, Luke Gospel, really Luke Gospel, chapter two. Right. Now I said all that because there was a preparation and getting everything ready for Jesus as an adult to be anointed by John the Baptist baptism. And then him having to go to Jerusalem at that time, Jerusalem was well prepared and well stopped and everything. And that's when he went to uh, Jerusalem every now and then. All right? So with your Bibles now, let's go to now to Luke chapter 3. Everybody, get your Bible, turn to Luke chapter 3. Now, in Luke chapter 3, we see the beginning ministry of, in a, 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 of Jesus, uh, excuse me, John the Baptist, son of who? Zacharias and who? Elizabeth. Right, right. Okay. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, being governor of Judea, Herod, being Tetris, that word Tetris is our word governor, the governor of Galilee, and his brother Philip of Ituria, and of the regions of Trachonius, whoa, wow, these words, Trachonius and Lysenius. See, these are the sons of Herod. Okay, the sons of Herod. Um, here we go. Okay. Now, let me explain that. Now, Herod the Great, all right, had brothers and sisters. He killed his brothers. <laughs> he poisoned one and had the other killed, and his sister, Salome, he had killed. Okay? Herod also, the great, had many wives. One, two, three, four, five wives, plus he had five others, so in a, he had ten. Okay. Out of these wives, he had um, sons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, he had 
about seven sons. And in these seven sons, of course, he had to uh, execute and get rid of some of them because they pose a threat to him. Most likely, these, these sons that he had executed or disinherited, they showed a spark of taking over his throne, probably. <laughs> he, he couldn't call, have that. But the other ones that we mentioned here in verse uh, 1 <coughs> of Luke chapter 3, they must have fell in line with their father <coughs> and obeyed him very well, and they didn't cause him any problems. And that's why he gave them rulership within his compound of his kingship. Okay? All right? Um, Philip ruled the territory, as you see here, along with his uh, other brother. See, they, they took the name Herod just like each Caesar was called Julius Caesar, Tiberius Caesar, Augustus Caesar, Claudius Caesar. See, they all took that, that name, that, that title so much. So the sons took the same title, name, Herod. So you got to differentiate the different Herods, even when there was a Herod that even Paul met a king called Herod in Acts chapter 21, 22. So you, that his family grew and exists even during the days of the Apostle Paul. But right here we see in verse 2 that his sons helped him rule the area that he was known as King of Judea, King of the Jews. Okay, Verse 2, Anus and Caiaphas was high priests. The word of the Lord came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. It came unto all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance. Now, the reason, now this is the reason why we chose to, with, along with the word of God, to bring in the historical, biblical historical setting. Because you need to know about the Jordan. The Jordan River was not the best of all rivers. But God chose the Jordan River in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Kings. There were other rivers in Judea that was more cleaner, uh, sweeter than the Jordan. But for what reasons God chose the Jordan River way even way back in the days of Joshua to be the most outstanding river that he chose to align himself with that river. All right? So we see that the Jordan River became the spot in which John the Baptist baptized people. John the Baptist it says here in verse 3, let me read it again, and it came, and John came unto all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. That was John's calling. Right. Now, to further look at that, you have to go back to the book of Malachi. So let's turn back to the prophet Malachi, as well as Isaiah. So we're going to find out something about John was the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the deliverer. This has been prophesied. All right? Malachi, all right? chapter 3 and chapter 4 is going to mention it. All right? So let's turn back to Malachi. Malachi is the, in, in the English Bible, it is the last book of the English Bible of the Old Testament. Chapter 3 Behold, I send my messenger. He shall prepare the way before me. Alright? Messenger. That was John the Baptist. 
Now, in chapter 3 of Malachi, there are two messengers mentioned. The forerunner of the Messiah, a messenger, John the Baptist. Then the second messenger is the messenger of the covenant in that first verse, Malachi 3 and 1. So you have the, you have the two messengers in one verse here. Again, I'll repeat, John the Baptist is the messenger of the Messiah, the forerunner of the Messiah. Jesus, the Messiah, is the messenger of the covenant. Chapter 4 of Malachi. Verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So the ministry of John the Baptist, let's go, well, let's not forget Isaiah before we go back to Luke. Um, let me see. Okay, in Isaiah chapter 40, I hope you're writing this down now. Isaiah chapter 40. Here is the prophecy once again, just like Malachi chapter 3 and chapter 4. It is the forerunner of, 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 the, of the Messiah announcing his ministry. Now what had happened was that the Pharisees, the Zealots, and all the other religious groups and militant groups, they thought G John was the Messiah because of what he did. But you notice John didn't perform any miracles. Right. He didn't, he didn't, only thing John did was prepare the way he preached and baptized people. All right. Isaiah chapter 40. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, says your God. Speak ye comfortable to Jerusalem and cry unto her, and her warfare is accomplished, that her sin is pardoned. For she had received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Verse 3, Isaiah 40 and 3. The voice of him that cries in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be made low, the crooked shall be made straight, the rough places plain. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. The voice say, cry. What shall I cry? All grass. So here John is, proph is prophesied by Isaiah that he's going to preach about sin about repentance and coming back to the Lord. He's preparing the way for the Messiah to come. All right, back, let's go back to Luke now. Let's go back to Luke, chapter, one, uh, chapter 3 here. Now, in Luke, chapter 3, verse 4, it, you, you see here in verse 4 that it goes right back to Isaiah. It's, it's, it, it, Luke is quoting from both Isaiah 40 and Malachi chapter 3 and chapter 4 here. Notice Luke chapter uh, 3 verse 4. As it is written in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah, the prophet saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth. All flesh shall see the deliverance of God. Okay, now, this is the ministry of the forerunner of the Messiah, who is who? Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus Christ. He's the Messiah. John the Baptist preparing the way for the Messiah to come. See, this is why we're 
we, we are sort of interacting between the scriptures and seeing what the historical setting to bring about the Messiah, his ministry, his full ministry, and what, what he accomplished in his ministry, mainly so his death, burial, and resurrection. Okay? Let's read on here in Luke chapter uh, 3 again concerning the ministry of John the Baptist and introducing the Messiah. Now, keep in mind, the way John is preaching here and presenting the truths and telling people to come to the Lord. See, now he's standing in the Jordan River. Sometimes he's on the mountaintop. His voice is sounding all over Jerusalem. They're hearing the echo, repent, repent. The Messiah is coming. The Messiah is coming. Once that is, is, is taking prevalence in Judea, he goes to the Jordan River. The, the, the Spirit of God is moving upon the hearts of people. They're gathering in Jordan now at this particular time to hear John preach once again and being baptized by John the Baptist. All right. We're at the point now here in verse 7 of chapter 3 of Luke. Because there's a gathering of different sorts of people. You have Roman soldiers coming. You're having the religious crowd coming. You're having the rich people come. The poor people. The sick. The lame. The leopard. All kinds of people is coming to Jordan to hear John present the coming, the message of the coming of the Messiah. You got to get your heart ready because he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. Not realizing that Jesus is of 29, 30 years and he's on route right now in chapter 3. Jesus is on route towards Jordan at this time. All right? Verse 7, Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generations of vipers, who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I say unto you that God is able to make these stones to rise up as children of Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the tree. Every tree, therefore, that bringeth not forth fruit, his fruit, his, his the fruit is hewn, is hewn down, cut down, and cast into fire. And the people began to ask John. What shall we do? Sound familiar? Acts 16, 31. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter says, Acts chapter 2 now, repent. Now, John is saying the same thing. So repentance is a necessity in coming to the Lord. You have to repent of your sins. Change your heart, change your mind, change your ways, change your who God, who you think God is and what he's able to do. There first need to be a repentance of the heart. At the same time, the repentance follow or follow with whichever is belief on the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now remember... There's only Jews here. There's no Gentiles. There's, you know, I mean, when we said, when we stress that all sorts of people was coming to this event, the main thrust of John's message, as well as Peter on the day of Pentecost, is to make the children of Israel first, before the Gentiles, realize they have sinned before God as their fathers did. They cried out, what must we do? Repent. 
And the same message is picked up with Jesus. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. So here John is using a, a metaphor and a symbol of fire here because fire purifies. So John is going to answer the people's question. Verse 11. He answered them and said, He that has two coats, let him impart to him that have no coat. Then came the publicans to be baptized unto him. Master, Rabbi, verse 12, what shall we do? He says that the publicans, remember the publicans were used by the Roman officials. They were Jews now. The publicans were Jews used by the Romans to gather taxes. So what had happened was that publicans set up their home base right there in the marketplace because people would come and buy their food, their animals, whatever they need, and the tax collectors set up booths right there. Who was the most famous in the New Testament time was called a publican? Matthew, right? Matthews. That's why Matthew was hated. <laughs> I mean, you can imagine when Matthew wrote the gospel, how it was received. These people have a tendency to have prejudice and bias because of a, a person, what they look, how they act, the color of their skin, or whatever. Right? This is Matthews. But a publican, they came and says, what, what, what can we do? What, G, what, Matt, what John says in verse 13, he says exact no more than that which appointed you. So, see, the publicans, when they set up booths, they had these balances. And you had to pay taxes to the Romans. So what they did was, they set, they had a, a, a weight that they put on one side of the scale. Your taxes had to outweigh that weight that they put on the scale. So in order for the publicans to get their greed of money, plus get the money for the Romans that was due to them, the taxes, they put extra weight on the people. And the people knew that. But they knew that they still had to pay the taxes to the Romans because what they paid they gave the taxes to the Romans, but at the same time, the publicans took without, outside of that money that the people gave and put it in their pockets also. That's why John the Baptist says, exact no more than that which appointed you. See, if you, if you put on that scale a weight that weighed, what, 16 ounces, which was one pound, you had to put on coins or whatever on that weight scale that would balance that. So in order for the, the, the publicans to get more, they put 32 ounces on that scale, which was double, 16 ounces, 16 ounces, which made it 32 ounces. So the people knew that, but they knew they still had to pay their taxes. So they, they grudgingly and Ah, they put 32 on there anyway. All right? So when they counted the change, they put the 32 on the weight, and it weighed up equal. The Pharisees, I mean, the publicans took the money and said, next, they put it in a bag, but another person working with the publicans would separate the money and give it to the guy doing the collection. So that's, that's how it was. You know, I mean, they do the same tactic in stores and advertisement even today. They will charge you, you know, $5 for a pound, one pound of sugar, wherein it should be, what, $2.50, but they're gaining, you know, more by charging $5, okay? So that's the same thing that the publicans were doing. 
verse 14. The soldiers likewise demanded of John, saying, What shall we do? John says, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and content with your wages. So those were the things that the Roman soldiers most likely the, 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 the guards at that time were doing. What were they doing? They were hurting people because of their position. They were policemen at that time. They were hurting people, teasing people, taunting people, because, look, I'm the law enforcement. I can do that because I'm the law. Do violence to no man. Neither accuse any falsely. They, at times... The soldiers would set people up, you know, like they do sometimes in modern times. They put drugs in the, in the trunk of the car, or they, under the mat, and they, they falsify information on your records and all that kind of stuff. They were doing that back in the days of John. He said, content with your wages. The, the soldiers complained a lot that they wasn't getting paid enough. Verse 15, as the people were expectation and all the men muse in their hearts of John whether he be the Christ, the Messiah. The word Christ there is the anointed one. The Messiah. John, verse 16, answered and said unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water. But one mightier than I comes, the lashes of whose shoes, you know, the string, the, the strap, the tightness, the, the sandal on the feet, I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into the garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. Now, we're not going to get into that because the, the time is, is, is not going to give us, it's not fair to get into this without getting into the depthness of what John is saying here. But the message, again, is to the gathering of the people here. John says that the Messiah, when he comes, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And that's what we're going to look at next week. What did Jesus do involving his ministry when he came that involved what John says, when he come, his ministry will be a ministry of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and with fire. Let's look to the Lord and pray. Father, we thank you for the blessedness of the word of God. We pray, Father, that you help us to understand your scriptures by the power of your Holy Spirit. Even so, guide us, Father, and help us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, continue reading in your home assignment, uh, chapter 3, <clears throat> because the sole purpose of this is to bring Jesus in the picture because of what John, John has said that the Messiah is coming. And when he comes, he's going to have a ministry of baptizing individuals with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So that's what we're going to look at. And here comes Jesus. So we're going to pick up with that uh, next week, the Lord's will. Right. Okay, 11.30, we're going to come back again at 11.30. And as we gather as a whole, the group coming back, we're coming back, and the sermon will be preached at 11.30. 4 o'clock is our biblical leadership class still dealing with only qualified men may serve. And we're going to be dealing with inclusively 
why only men can be called into the ministry and they must be qualified. We're going to be looking at that at 4 o'clock. Then at 5.30 will be the evening worship service continuing our expository preaching and teaching in the book of Revelations, closing out chapter 2 and 3, the seven churches, as, as, as we see there in chapter 2 and 3, to bring on the teaching and preaching of chapter 4 of Revelation 4 and 5. We thank the Lord. All right, so we're, we're going to conclude now. And thank you for watching and thank you for uh, taking the time to be a part of this Sunday school class, Jesus and His Times.